presenters today that we're privileged to have. Uh, Elizabeth Cole, uh, master's in PT, assistive technology practitioner. Since 1985, Elizabeth has been involved in many aspects of assistive technology, including practice as a PT, managing a seating clinic, education in seating mobility, and reimbursement consulting. She lectures extensively, is published in industry journals, is a member of key industry organizations, as involved in many industry-wide work groups dedicated to regulatory legislative policies. As the Director of Clinical Rehab Services for U.S. Rehab, Elizabeth develops educational products in seating and mobility, assistive technology, and clinical reimbursement. Our second presenter is Laura Cohen, a PhD PT, assistive technology practitioner, seating mobility specialist. She is the principal for rehabilitation and technology consultants in Arlington, Virginia. She is the executive director of the Clinicians Task Force, a national group of seeing and mobility clinicians working to influence Medicare and Medicaid coding, coverage, and payment policies for complex rehab and assistive technology devices. Dr. Cohen provides counsel, leadership, and clinical expertise to clients when it comes to medical necessity, benefit integrity, policy development, and compliance. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to this session. I'm always a little concerned about speaking right after lunch, because that's usually the snooze time, so I'm hoping that we can really get you riled up talking about some of these uh, legislative uh, policies and um, regulatory uh, policies and um, keep you awake by getting you maybe a little angry. Uh, <laughs> so um, Laura and I are going to tag team today, and we have Unfortunately, for both Laura and I, we have, usually have way more to say than we have time to say it in. So um, hopefully we can get through this all. We might be talking a little quickly at times to try to get through all the um, different slides. Oh, we do we have to say that? We have no financial? Oh, <laughs> so neither of us have any financial uh, relationship or with with any product that we're going to talk and talk about but we do want to make it um, clear that we don't like the policies so we have no financial relationships with them we don't like them um, so uh, we'd also like to acknowledge some folks that have helped um, with in putting this together with feeding us information and and um, and keeping us updated the clinician task force which Laura is the executive director of um, also, NCART, and in particular, um, Kara Backenheimer, who helped with, a, um, actually gave us some of her slides for uh, part of this presentation, as well as input from Rita Hostack and Don Clayback, and the, the steering committee for the separate benefit category, which, for those of you interested, is um, actually on the next, uh, the next session, session, which I have a slide on as well. Um, so we're going to talk about these uh, issues here. Um, and the first one, the, well, we also have some acronyms here that for, just for um, your referral, if we start talking in acronyms, which we are famous for in this industry, um, and you, you, we're talking about something you're not sure of, please, uh, you can quick refer back to this. I'm not going to read through them all um, as we uh, go through these slides. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is uh, reclassification of some uh, durable medical equipment items, and this happened um, back uh, last year, actually the end of 2013, I think. Um, and just sort of to get you uh, in the in the mood for talking about classification, as we know that um, all DME items are paid according to what um, payment category they are in. So we have two payment categories in particular that apply to durable medical equipment. We have the routinely purchased, um, inexpensive and routinely, routinely purchased category. Uh, and if something is uh, uh, classified under that category, then the, when the provider provides that piece of equipment, the supplier provides that piece of equipment, um, the company is paid in one lump sum for that. Um, they get it all up front 
when, they, uh, when the claim is approved and the beneficiary owns the equipment at that point. And then as you know, we have the capped rental category and with, in this category, the provider supplies the item and then they are paid on, um, on a monthly basis. They're paid a certain sum on a monthly basis for 13 months. And during that 13 months, they still own the equipment, they're still responsible for it, for any repair or maintenance that happens. At the end of 13 months, the uh, beneficiary, beneficiary then takes, takes ownership of that piece of equipment. Um, so obviously, uh, it's, it's much nicer to get paid in one lump sum for something than to have to spread the payment out over 13 months, um, sort of like being a credit card. Um, so at uh, CMS, um, uh, probably in 2013 sometime, looked at a number of DME items, and um, they decided that some of these items really, that were, these were items that were in the routinely purchased category. And they decided that these items really didn't, they should really look at them because they really thought that maybe they didn't belong in that category. And you've got a list of these uh, products here. They included adult manual tilts, all your pediatric wheelchairs, um, so your E1234s through E1238s so or whatever they are, uh, power assist, power seating, and power elevating leg rests, uh, specialty controls for wheelchairs, and then a bunch of accessories and op options and accessories. I've just put a couple of them up here but because there's, there's a whole list. Um, but replacement joysticks, actuators, motors, gearbox, vent trays, some walkers, and group one support surfaces. So all of these were classified as routinely purchased, and Medicare decided to look at them and say, do they really, should they really be in that category? Um, the only exceptions were if any of those items were um, provided on complex rehab technology power wheelchairs, then they were, they were, were to remain in um, the routinely uh, purchased um, category. So that included your power seating, specialty controls, some of those items that are um, only uh, typically put on, if, if they are put on a CRT power wheelchair, then they would remain uh, as a purchase. Um, if something is, even if something's in the purchase category, the supplier still has to give the rental option to the beneficiary. So even if it's in that routinely purchase, the beneficiary might say, and I don't know why they would do this, but um, you know, I want, I'd rather have it be rented for 13 months um, because it, it, and the only, the benefit to them is they pay their copay in monthly benefits, but uh, monthly payments. So um, there are a number of problems with this, uh, and this is, and I'll talk about some of the issues that have happened, but just in, in to talk about uh, um, someone who goes into a long-term care facility, let's say that a beneficiary has a DME item and they own it and they go into a nursing home, even if it's for a short time, that's fine. They bring their wheelchair with them and um, they can use it while they're in the long-term care facility. But if, they, if it's in the middle of a capped rental period, then when they go into the nursing home, the supplier can no longer bill for that. They can't continue to bill the monthly payments because the nursing home is long-term care facility is supposed to provide it. So, you know, what does that mean? Are they going to go and pick up the item or, or the part or accessory um, from the beneficiary? So it's, it's, uh, it it's kind of leaves that uh, an issue with that as far as the long-term care facility. So how was this determined? How, why did they decide to um, put these items in capped rental from routinely purchased? So they looked at the definition of routinely purchased. And this was from 1987, um, when, this was, when these categories were first developed. And basically, Medicare was looking at a way to not pay a f the full payment price of something if it was only going to be used for a short term. So, um, you know, they felt that there were some DME items that were being provided and the person, you know, uh, passed away after a couple of months. Or maybe they were just using it for temporary use as they were rehabbing and they only needed it for a couple of months. So they decided to create this um, capped rental category so that they wouldn't be paying for the whole lump sum. 
And the definition of routinely purchased was equipment that was purchased at least 75% of the time from July 1986 to June 1987. Um, so when they, when they looked at the, the items that they looked at in two, 2013, they looked at those items, they looked at the claims from 1986, 1987, and said, okay, if these items were not purchased at least 75% of the time during that time period, then by definition, we're gonna put them in the capped rental period. So again, why did they use technology, or why were they using 1986, 1987 claims data when some of these items didn't even exist back then? So for instance, adult tilts. Adult tilt and spaces did not exist for those of us who were in the industry that long ago. Remember, they weren't even in existence back then. So basically, CMS said, well, we have no data to show that they were purchased at least 75% of the time, so they capped rental. Well, there was no data to show that they weren't purchased more than 75% of the time either, but that's the way it is. As far as the pediatric wheelchairs, they looked at youth wheelchairs that were um, claims of that, and youth wheelchairs back then were probably just smaller standard wheelchairs, and they said, okay, in, back then, and they were probably used for kids you know, who had orthopedic injuries or something like that, and they said, okay, they were only purchased 25% of the time, so all pediatric wheelchairs should be in capped rental. So they're basically looking at data from a period when the technology did not even exist, but their, um, their uh, sort of rationale for this is that they're following the definition of routinely purchased. The de definition's never been changed, so they have to use that. Um, so implementation on this, in um, April of 2014, any of those items that were not included in any competitive bid program automatically were reclassified at that time. Um, it'll roll out this July where any, if, if an item has been included in um, round two competitive bidding, uh, uh, sorry, um, if, it's, if it's in a competitive bid program other than round one recompete or included in round one recompete but not provided in an area other than a round one recompete. So if you can interpret that gobbledygook, you can figure out which items are included. Um, and then January 2017, it will inc basically include the items if they're in round one recompete as well. So basically, if it's in, the, some of the competitive bid areas are exempt from this right now. Um, we know that some of these items are not used short term, um, particularly when you look at adult tilt and space and pediatric wheelchairs. Um, and so we've seen a lot of changes. We've seen, um, you know, and I'm sure some of you uh, suppliers in the um, room can attest to the fact that either you um, no longer can provide adult tills or you're providing, I, I actually put a little survey out to um, a whole bunch of therapists to see what the impact was. And the answers I got back were um, some of the suppliers are just not providing adult tilts anymore. Some are providing them, but they're providing um, less costly or simpler models. Some felt, you know, there were era times when they they may have been providing adults in tilt and spaces in some referral sources, but not in others. So there was kind of a, um, a varied response, but basically every single response was the access to these um, items has been um, either all change or um, you know they're they're having to make do with lesser products, um, and also. We're seeing, you know, the, it, because of the way that the suppliers and you guys are not get, are getting reimbursed or not getting reimbursed, um, service has decreased and, and um, the time, maybe even the timeliness of service. So um, there's been some big changes already. Um, what we don't see is maybe some of the changes that are happening amongst the suppliers where they've had to make cuts in their, um, you know, their businesses. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of these... Um, areas where I, I feel like we're just chipping away at the bottom and eventually the whole thing's going to fall in. So um, this, is, this, the, the, this has been a policy change that has not been beneficial to our, um, to our industry. 
Um, and it will continue to, they're going to continue to roll this out um, to other products uh, through the, um, um, that are not currently in competitive bid pro uh, areas. So that's the, the uh, change for some of these products from routinely purchased to cap rental. Um, another uh, policy or another program that we've seen um, actually expand over the last year is the prior authorization demo project for power mobility. Um, and this actually has some positive aspects to it, so that's, this is a good thing. Um, so as we know, just kind of as a ba background, historically there's no uh, prior appro approval process under Medicare. You know, the, the supplier, um, you guys, you know, you work with the suppliers, you decide what's needed, the, the supplier orders the equipment, delivers it, and then they put in for um, reimbursement for the product. So, and risk, you know, cross your fingers and pray <laughs> that you're gonna get paid and that you're gonna get paid appropriately. Um, also, we know that a lot of the, most of all the claims are approved or are denied electronically up front. So a lot of the corroborating and supporting documentation may or may not be seen until there's some kind of pre or post pay review or um, an audit. And so um, some of these are, uh, it's a pay and chase system. So there are probably, unfortunately, a lot of claims that go through that um, probably aren't appropriate. I think, you know, CMS has, has caught on to this and probably thinks that it's, um, you know, it's everybody that's doing it, which we know it's not. But, um, and also, you know, some of these, uh, as you, I'm sure many of you in the room can attest to, um, many of these claims are denied based on just simple clerical errors or things like that that could easily be um, adjusted if there was some kind of prior approval process. So back in 2000, uh, September of 2012, um, they started a demo project for prior approval for certain power, types of power mobility devices. So it included your group one uh, scooters, your group uh, one and two power wheelchairs, all, all group one and all group two, group three power wheelchairs, but only the um, ones with no power options, group five power wheelchairs, and miscellaneous. Um, obviously does not include group two POVs or group four PO, uh, power wheelchairs because these are statutorily non-covered. Um, began rolling out in seven states initially. This was in September 2012. And they felt that, and these are the, you can read the states up there, and the reason why they picked these was there were, these states accounted for 47% of all power wheelchair claims across the country. Um, they expanded it this past October to include 12 more states, um, so many of you might be included now in one of these uh, demo um, project areas. So how does it work? In this case, it's just like most other prior approval processes in that the supplier collects all the documentation um, and they submit it for review. And it, none of the requirements for the documentation has changed. So you have to submit the same things that you've always had to change, none of that, the same, you know, the seven element written order, the face-to-face -face, uh, progress note, the, the um, detailed product description, um, if, an, if ATP documentation is required, a specialty evaluation from a therapist is required, that gets submitted, attestation statements, pretty much everything except the delivery ticket, because that hasn't happened yet, um, is submitted. And then the, the reviewers look this over. They're supposed to respond um, with a, a response that's postmarked within 10 business days of the submission. And both the patient, the uh, supplier, the physician, and the beneficiary all get notice as to whether it has been um, received a, a yes or a no. So um, if the prior approval, if the, if the claim is claim, it's not really a claim yet, but if it's approved, then it gets a, you know, a, a tracking number. Um, the supplier can go ahead and order and deliver the power wheelchair and submit the claim, and it should get paid. Um, if it's denied, then they get a letter back saying why it was denied. And the good thing about this is the, um, the reason codes, 
as to why it's been denied are, are, have been significantly expanded compared to what they usually get when they get a denied code. So it's very, there's some very specific, specific information as to why they feel that, that um, the documentation is, is missing something or you know, medical necessity hasn't been proven or whatever. So, um, and I'll, I'll get to in a minute why that can be a really good thing. If um, you get a negative uh, or a denial, PA denial, you can resubmit it for, again, if you have additional information or um, you know, something else that wants to add. So you can submit that and then you'll receive another response within 20 days of that resubmission. And there's no limitation on the number of times you can resubmit. Um, for those of you who do ADMCs, you know that there is a limitation on how many times you can resubmit within that, I think it's a six month period. Um, if a claim is, is, if you get a negative prior approval and you still go ahead and submit the claim, it will be denied. If you are in a prior, prior approval demo state and you decide not to go through the PA process and you submit the claim, um, they will immediately pull that claim for review, so it will not go through the electronic approval process. They'll pull it and they'll review the documentation. If they decide that the documentation is sufficient, they'll approve the claim, but you'll get a 25% reduction in reimbursement, in the normal reimbursement that you would get. So they're really trying to encourage um, you to go through the PA process if you're in one of those PA demo states. Um, the exceptions are the contract suppliers in the competitive bid areas. They are not um, uh, required to go through the PA process. Um, and or if a claim is submitted with any of these modifiers. So these are the GA modifiers basically um, saying that you have, you know it's probably, it's gonna get denied because of medical necessity, but you have an ABN, a signed ABN, and then GY and EY modifiers mean that you either don't have a physician's order or you know, you know it's, it's statutorily non-covered. So why is this a good thing? Well, first of all, it gives you an idea beforehand, a much better idea beforehand, if the, the documentation is in order and if um, Medicare or the contractors uh, feel that this is a, um, you know, that they would approve the claim. So a little bit more assurance that you're going to get paid and less risk that you're going to eat the, co the cost of that. Um, when I, I mentioned before about the, uh, the letter going out, so it goes out to the supplier, it goes out to the physician, and it goes out to the beneficiary. And the good thing about that is it clearly says to the physician why the documentation was not sufficient. And um, how many of you here have had claims um, denied or come back or whatever because of insufficient physician documentation? Okay, so, and, and how many of you have had the physician say, you're asking for too much, or, you know, that's not my, yeah, right. So this, this is coming from CMS, and it's saying, hey, you know, doctor, whoever, your, your documentation is not sufficient, and that's why this is getting denied. So hopefully this is, you know, maybe some kind of an educational tool for the physicians to say, you know, you need to step up and, and write um, uh, proper documentation if you want your patients to get the, uh, the, um, the equipment. So, um, and it eliminates the pay and chase. So, uh, it really, you know, I, I had this on the slide, it should have no negative effects for those who are doing um, things right. And hopefully that's right, although I heard an interesting uh, story today where, um, one of the suppliers put out, uh, they took two um, orders and they submitted both of them, both to ADMC and for prior approval. And they got two different answers between ADMC and prior the prior approval. Yeah, yeah, not so shocking, unfortunately, but it's like, come on guys, you know, like, you can't, we need agreement here on, 
you know, whether something's sufficient or not. So maybe there's still some education that needs to be done on, on their end, I don't know, but. Um, just uh, some data that I, the, to go along with this from uh, the uh, monthly dollars spent for power wheelchairs um, decreased from 12 million to 3 million in the demo states. Um, and this was between September and June, so that first six month period. Um, where, and it decreased from 20 million to 9 million in, in non-demo states. So the interesting thing is even in the non-demo states, it, the, the number of dollars spent on power wheelchairs decreased significantly. Now CMS is touting that this is because it's helped to reduce fraud and it's helped to weed out the suppliers that are doing it incorrectly and you know, trying to process uh, or provide chairs that really shouldn't be. I think there's a lot of other <laughs> reasons why the number of power wheelchairs has declined, um, you know, like we can't afford to put them out anymore. Um, decrease in the number of beneficiaries, that's also, it's been 69% in demo states, 65% in non-demo states. And again, their CMS is saying that this is, this is showing that um, only the people who really need the power wheelchairs are getting them. I might have some issue with that, but. Um, and uh, 40, in, in this six month, first six month period, um, there were 48,000 something PA requests submitted and 47% for, were denied or non-affirmed. Non um, so, and basically this, most of it was because they felt that the documentation did not support the medical necessity. So again, we, um, I, I think this, and, and I think this is a good thing um, from what most, most of the suppliers that I know of are happy with the demo project. It would be interesting to hear maybe during the question and answer period from if, if you guys feel that's otherwise, but um, it's, I think that there are a number of good things about it as far as reducing the risk of you, know, you eating the cost of the chair, you know up front. It does take longer um, for some, you, know, you do have to wait the 10 days and, uh, to get the, the um, approval and non-approval, so um, you can't sometimes get the, the things delivered as quickly as maybe you used to, but um, you've got a lot better assurance as payment, and hopefully, again, it will help to educate as far as um, good documentation practices um, for the physicians. So um, here, this is just a resource here if you want to um, go there to, to um, find out more information about this. And I'm gonna turn it over to Laura. Okay, I'm gonna talk about the final rule for the end stage renal disease prospective payment system, quality incentive program, and demi post. Oddly enough, um, CMS released a, a public, a proposed final rule last year and tucked inside of it was all of this stuff about demi posts. So I'd like to know from the group how many have heard of this final rule. Okay, kind of what I thought. And the final rule, true or false, the final rule expands competitive bidding fee schedule nationwide, including rural areas beginning January 1st, 2016. True. And the final rule includes a provision for bundle payments for durable medical equipment. True. So wake up. This is gonna come as a, it's gonna rock your world. Okay, so what does the final rule do? The, the rule establishes a methodology that CMS will use to reduce payment amounts um, for items included in competitive bidding um, areas in non, bid areas, and they have used, um, established four different categories of, and methodologies that follow, and I'm gonna talk about them. Um, the first one is adjustments for items included in more than 10 competitive bid areas, adjustments for lower volume or other items included in 10 or less competitive bid areas, adjustments for items where the only available single um, product amount is from a competitive bid program no longer in effect, and adjustments for accessories used with different types of base equipment. And so what does this mean to you? So number one methodology, this would include um, the items in more than 10 competitive bid areas, things like power wheelchair batteries, group two power wheelchairs, standard power wheelchair accessories, casters, and forks. Um, 
category number two is the lower volume or other items included in 10 or less competitive bid areas. And we really had a hard time coming up with what those might be. And the, so we don't think that there's very many, but pediatric transport share would be one that we, we identified. Um, and the third category would be items where the only available single payment amount is from a competitive bid product no longer in effect. Okay, so that would be the CRT accessories and adjustable skin protection cushions. Um, and then the fourth category is accessories used with different types of base equipment. And so this includes your um, seating components like headrests, lateral pelvic supports, trays. It's really, there's um, um, many codes that are combination codes that are durable medical equipment and complex rehab technology combined codes that have dissimilar products grouped together. And basically when we attempted to get new codes established for the complex rehab technology, CMS um, decided instead just to add the word like any type to the end of it. So it's headrest any type. And so therefore that's this category. So this, this affects CRT people. So um, this is how they're gonna do it. They're gonna split the country up into eight, um, eight regional RSPAs, <laughs> regional single, no. Here it is at the bottom, Ringle, yeah, our, our regional SPAs. I'm sorry, these, this is really, this, this rule was what, 176 pages? It was really complex. <laughs> um, so there's so gonna be these eight different um, regions and these are the states that are included in the far right hand corner um, column shows how many MSAs are in that region, okay? So the methodology they're gonna use is to reduce the rates in the non-bid areas in condition number one, which was for the items included in greater than 10 competitive bid areas, is that they're going to adjust the payments by the regions. Based on the eight regions, they're gonna calculate an unweighted average of the single payment amounts from the competitive bid areas in that region. And um, then they're going to limit it by a national ceiling of 110% and a floor of 90% for the national average regional single payment amounts. So what that means um, is they're gonna take all of the regional single payment amounts from all those eight, eight different um, regions and they're gonna take an average and then they're gonna calculate 110% to be the ceiling and 90% to be the floor and then they're gonna go back and look at the averages in each and if it's um, if the RSPA falls below the national floor, the payment will be the floor amount. I see the glaze. <laughs> and, and some jaws. Okay. Um, so they're gonna phase this in, so it's less of a shocker. Um, and it begins January 1, 2016, so we are less than 12 months out. Um, for the first six months, um, they will blend um, reimbursement of 50% of the old rate and 50% of the new RSPA. So that's a big math problem for your computers. Um, and then in July, six months later, they're going to convert to the 100% of the RSPAs. And rural areas um, will be paid at 110% of the national average. Right now, they have not been included in competitive bidding, but they will be included in the expansion of um, pricing. And CMS will be announcing these new S RSPA rates prior to implementation, but we don't know when. Um, what? Yes. <laughs> um, and then this is how CMS defines rural. It's a geographic area represented by a zip code. Um, if it at least 50% of the total geographic area included in the zip code is estimated to be outside any M metropolitan statistical area. So, so that's a hard one. They haven't defined these. Um, it will also include a geographic area represented by a zip code that is a low population density area that has already been carved out and excluded from competitive bid areas. It does include Alaska, Guam, and Hawaii, which um, is gonna be hard for them. Um, and um, CMS has not identified these areas by zip code, but it, we expect them to be very few. 
This is what it means in money. So these are examples of regional single payment amounts for items included in greater than 10 competitive bid areas. The top one, this is a slide from Kara, um, and so we thank her. These are estimates that they calculated. All of They had to go in and get the, pri the competitive bid pricing for each of those regions and zip codes and calculate all this. So the, the first one is a semi-electric hospital bed, EO260. So um, the current reimbursement is $132.39. So with the new, um, the, for phase one, which is 50%, it will be, um, the ceiling will be $105 and the floor will be $78. And you can look across to your region of the variation um, between the different regions. The second one, second color there is K1, manual wheelchair. And so right now the current um, fee schedule is $58.25. The ceiling will be set at 43.73 in um, January and then decrease down to um, 29.20 um, in July. It's a monthly payment amount, yes. And then the KO823, which is a group two power wheelchair, the current um, price is $568.89. The ceiling will be $442 in um, January and drop down to $315 in um, July. So this is a, an example of the amount of cut that this means. Um, for CRT items. This is the number three category um, of methodologies. So it's the items in less than 10 competitive bid areas and competitive bid pricing that's no longer in effect, or products that are no longer in effect. And if you remember, all complex rehab technology was initially included in round one until we had Congress intervene and carve out complex rehab. But even though it was carved out and exempt from competitive bidding, it was initially included in round one bidding, so they have interpreted that and applied it to CRT items. So um, this top line example is the wheelchair accessory power seating system recline only with mechanical shear reduction. Um, the current fee um, schedule amount is $5,400. The adjusted fee schedule will be $4,150, and that's a 23% change, dec decrease. The skin protection and positioning wheelchair seat cushion adjustable um, will right now is $370.93. The new um, adjusted fee will be $292, which is a 21% reduction. And then the power wheelchair accessory, the head control or extremity control interface, um, electronic proportional electronics and hardware previous or currently is $5,500, the adjusted fee schedule will be $4,278, and um, the percent change is 22%, and I believe that's the, the full purchase price. I think this says the same thing, but clearer. <laughs> Whoops, okay. All right, the other shocker in this is um, the announcement that as part of this final rule, CMS will be phasing in a new bundling payment methodology. It will take place of the current capped rental and purchase payment rules, and it will um, consist of payment on one continuous rental basis. So the product will um, never transfer ownership to the beneficiary, it will always remain um, in possess, you know, the supplier will always own it, which means you will always have to pay for all of the repairs and maintenance on it. So the single payment amount will be one monthly payment over the lifetime of that equipment, and suppliers must do their competitive bidding based on the cost that it will take to provide the base equipment and all the accessories provided on it, maintenance and servicing, and replacement of supplies and accessories over the lifetime of that equipment. So how many of you have any idea how much that costs? We don't have much data on that. Plus, isn't there a big wild card in that um, 
there are so many factors that are outside of your control, right? You have the activity level of the user, you have the environment where they're gonna use it, you have the diversity of products within one code. There's just so many unknowns. Um, so, it's, you know, we have to prepare for this as an industry. Um, so, the, the first phase, um, the, the, this demonstration project will be up to 12 new bid areas, and there's currently 80 possible metropolitan statistical areas with populations of at least 250,000 that um, it could be chosen from. And the next phase is via rulemaking, because there was a um, public comment period. There was a proposed final rule in July, like 4th of July, and um, the final rule comments were do, um, or the proposed, yeah, the final rule comments were due at Thanksgiving because they always do this right before uh, American holiday. So we get to work hard and write comments on these, these things. And so all of your professional organizations um, worked really hard and you really need to thank your leaders for the difficulty it was to interpret this very complicated rule but for um, taking the time and the effort to write comments on your behalf. Uh, NCART submitted comments, AA Home Care submitted comments, the Clinician Task Force submitted comments, US Rehab submitted comments, um, the American Physical Therapy Association submitted comments, um, are the, and United Spinal and Item Coalition as consumer groups and United um, submitted comments as well. Um, but it's a little alarming that we're this far down the road with implementation looming in January and that you're going to have to have knowledge, data to inform your um, bidding for these bundled payments very soon. Um, so when is this gonna happen? It's gonna happen in conjunction with round two recompete and will be implemented in 2017, and that's yet to be announced when. And how many items will be bundled together? We've asked questions, we've submitted comments, and don't know the answers. Um, it could be one bundled code. There was talk of making one power mobility code for all power mobility. That included all standard base power chairs, accessories, batteries, seating, everything. And then there was another discussion, you know, other, other information that has come in that it could keep base codes separate and bundle in for each base everything else. Um, so CMS is, will uh, um, provide advance notice of details to be determined. So stay tuned for that. Um, Medicare wheelchair repairs is my next happy topic. So um, CMS announced policy in August of last year, and then they rescinded it and updated it in October, and it was effective in November. Um, and what it basically did was indicated that Medicare, if Medicare paid for um, base equipment initially, then medical necessity for the base equipment has been established, which then allows suppliers who um, ha are faced with consumers who have been orphaned because their company that they got their chair from went out of business or they moved um, or could not get any of the supportive documentation. It allows them to get um, repairs done um, without you having to chase down the, that documentation. Let me finish. Um, contractors to o are only to review the necessity of the repair and make a payment determination. The necessity of the repair must be addressed in either the physician's or the supplier's records, but the medical necessity for the base is considered established if Medicare paid for it. Um, the repair policy update. The contractor um, shall ensure that the supplier's documentation records include the nature of the repair, the work performed to restore the equipment to functionality um, to meet that beneficiary's needs. So how many of your um, repair departments um, have thorough good documentation? Okay, we did a session yesterday. So really um, supplier documentation has to expand your whole 
um, corporate culture from your customer service rep who's documenting why a new referral is coming through your door and what's wrong through what, what's being, what the diagnostics were on a repair, what items need to be um, repaired, and the amount of labor that's going to um, be need, estimated to do that repair. And I would argue, because it's a soapbox I get on all the time, that a good practice would be that your documentation always includes a start time, an end time, and a total time. Because if we want to start to be able to collect data of what the actual time was, you need to start someplace. And if we remember back to um, the OIG report, I forget what year it was. It was, it was a while ago, where we were looking at um, the cost of the service part of what suppliers do for complex rehab technology. The OIG um, audited um, supplier documentation to see what you guys do. And they found that you don't do anything because it wasn't written down, right? So your travel time, um, the time that you go to clinic with your therapist, the time you call the manufacturer to report or to see if two things will fit together and, and can be used to get, be integrated together, the time that you're taking a, mocking up a loaner or a trial piece of equipment and bringing it out to their house to try it, you should be documenting all of that. You're gonna need that information if we go to bundled payments. You need to know how much it really costs for you to do the services that you're providing. Okay. Um, so, to, to reiterate, Medicare contractors um, shall not require a face-to-face -face examination for repair of items already covered and paid for by Medicare. This is not true, though, if it was not Medicare purchased. If it was not, um, if it was purchased by another payer, Medicaid, self-pay, private pay, um, you still have to establish medical necessity according to Medicare requirements but Medicare will pay for repairs to patient-owned equipment. They don't have to get an entirely new replacement share, and I did get a phone call about that last week, that there were some suppliers saying that because Medicare didn't buy the chair, they wouldn't repair it, and that's not accurate. You do need to have um, documentation, though, that that person meets eligibility criteria for the base that they are in. Um, documentation from the physician or treating practitioner that indicates that the um, Demi post item being repaired continues to be medically necessary and is needed, and um, that the documentation is timely and that it's happened recently in less than the past year, unless it says so differently in the Medicare policy. Um, and that's what I just said. Um, well, the Medicare contractors will only apply this guidance when reviewing claims for repairs of beneficiary-owned equipment if it was covered and paid for by Medicare. And they will use the same um, LCDs, coverage, payment, and documentation requirements, um, and only assess the necessity of the repair and whether the equipment was fixed. Okay, replacement of competitive bid items is different than repair. And I, I'm sorry, I, I still get this confused. It's very hard to understand the, the differences. Um, so any Medicare enrolled supplier can repair any and replace parts of beneficiary owned equipment if the repair is necessary to make the equipment serviceable, it's non-routine maintenance, um, and that labor to repair the equipment is payable at the fee schedule amount. But only a contract supplier can replace a competitive bid item if it is not part of a repair and is provided to a Benny in a competitive bid area. And so in a competitive bid area, Medicare pays um, the single payment amount for the replacement part um, if it is a competitive bid item and if it's used to repair base equipment that is also a competitive bid item. Otherwise, the payment for the part is based on the lower of the actual charge or the fee schedule for the replacement part. Do you want to say what the difference between repair and replacement? Okay. Okay. Um, so, phase. Um, 
So the, the national competitive bidding rules round two recompete um, specifies that they'll phase in this new repair rule. It will be in up to 10, 12 competitive bid areas um, in round, possibly in round, re two bit, um, round two rebid. I don't think we know yet. Um, they will, again, it will be under the current rental rules. Bidders will have to factor into their bids and costs the maintenance, um, repair, and ownership, after ownership transfer, and until the medical needs end or five years. And also, what, how they'll handle it if the beneficiary moves outside of the competitive bid area. Um, it's limit, the rule is limited to the, only the items you furnished, and you're not responsible for repairing items someone else provided, which really doesn't address our issue where patients can't get their items that they own repaired, because the, mostly because the fee schedule is below your cost. So now we're going to talk about other legislation, and I'm going to start with our CRT legislation. Um, both Liz and I um, serve on the um, Separate Benefit Category Steering Committee, and we are working um, for our the third time to get our legislation reintroduced into the Senate and the um, House. Um, and so we, we expect we're working on it actively right now. Um, and for those who um, don't know, what this will do is it will create a separate category for complex rehab technology within the Demi Post benefit. It will um, segregate complex rehab technology from durable medical equipment. Um, it will allow us to get unique codes, coverage, and payment for CRT items. So there's all those blended codes that we said were problematic because they had dissimilar products grouped together. This will allow us a new set of codes that just represent the, the CRT items with corresponding coverage policies and, pay, and fee schedule. And so this will be presented in IC11 um, coming up at 2.30 in Presidential Ballroom D by Don Claybeck, who's our fearless leader. And then um, how many of you have been to this website? Access the number two CRT.org. Write it down. A C C E S S, the numeral two, C R T dot O R G. And oh, do we have a little clicker? Yeah, we do. That's the little logo. And click over here. Oh, no, click over here and sign up to get on the alert system so that you get blasts when there's things that you need, we need you to do and ways you can help and how you can take action. And then click here and register to come to the CRT um, conference. We have legis a legislative day. I think it's on the, is it on the 12th? Yeah. Um, that will be going on the Hill. And so we need you at, um, to be there on the Hill. And if you can't be with us, we need you to make some phone calls two days before this so that they know, make noise, schedule a lunch meeting with all of your staff, have them bring their cell phones and make calls, send emails um, that week. The way that um, our issues get raised to the level that they get brought to the attention of your representative is when they get a critical mass of calls. So it's about a numbers game. So one passionate person will not make a difference. It takes your constituents. And you can, and the key committees that are most important are the Senate um, Finance Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee. If your member resides in one of those important committees, we need you. We need you to make a relationship with that person. It's not a one-time deal, it's a recurrent deal. And Don will go into that more later, but I just wanted to draw your attention to this link. Educational Materials um, is a really good site. It has the packet, the talking points, it's the materials that we leave behind when we do a Senate visit. But we need all of you to push this over the line to get this legislation attached. It needs to raise to project status with your members. So you need to go to your member and say, we need your help. We are not surviving, people are not being served, this is what I need you to do. I need you to sign on and to be persistent until you get an answer. So um, 
with that, I'm going to let Liz talk again. And um, for those of you who have never been, uh, done a hill visit, I'm telling you, it is an awesome experience. It's, first of all, it's so empowering. Um, and because you really feel like you've done something when you get out of there. And it's just a great experience to, to be in Washington, to go and visit your uh, representatives, your um, senators, and um, just, you know, be an advocate. So. Um, I encourage everybody as well to, to do that. If you can't make it to Washington, remember that you can always go and visit your uh, legislators when they're in their home office. If you're, and bring a consumer with you. Yeah, that's even better. Great. Okay, so I want to talk about um, a couple of other pieces of legislation that are out there and bring you up to date. The first one is the Medicare Demi Post Competitive Bidding Improvement Act. Um, and this is uh, sometimes referred to as the Binding Bid Act. So if you hear that name thrown around, um, it's, it's, that's pretty much what we're talking about. And um, one of the, a couple of the real um, kind of glaring issues with the competitive bid program, one is that anyone can bid <clears throat> and, or submit a bid um, to be a contract supplier, and then they can be offered the contract and they can just uh, decide not to take it. And so what that does is it allows companies to really lowball on the bids and then back out. And, and it really brings the, um, the final payment amount down because they're, they've, you know, the, the final payment amount is based on an average. So um, either people, you know, in, um, some of the companies can do it, you know, for kind of nefarious reasons. Um, there might be other companies that, bid too low because they don't do the financials right or whatever and then realize that they can't survive um, with that bid. But at any rate, they can, um, they can bow out and the single payment amounts are not readjusted when these low ballers um, back out. So part of this uh, legislation would um, require you to, sub to um, have a um, to um, uh, pr have a bond, and if you are uh, if you are offered a contract and you decide not to take it, then you lose that money. You lose the bond money. Um, and again, this can just it can help to prevent that lowballing. Um, the other another big issue, particularly with with um, I think it was round one recompete, um, was that uh, a lot some of the um, con the suppliers that actually won contracts and they didn't necessarily, weren't necessarily in the state or the MSA where they, particularly the state where they um, won the contract and they actually did not have state licensure to provide some of those um, products. And I know Tennessee was, I think, one of the uh, um, big ones, Ohio, Maryland. So we had a bunch of contract winners who, um, because of state license, um, because of state licensure, which they didn't have, weren't able to actually provide the product, and so though they, um, those contracts were taken back. So another part of this uh, legislation would require that if you're um, bidding on uh, for a contract, that you have to have the appropriate licensure to do that. So um, this last year, this was uh, uh, it was um, submit or. Uh, championed by um, Representative Tiberi and Larson um, and Senators Portman and Senator Cardin. And we're um, looking to reintroduce that. Uh, we're looking to reintroduce that this year to this Congress, but um, we have some late date, late date intel. <laughs> um, right here in this room, you are hearing the latest. Um, so we found out today that the uh, Ways and Means Committee is actually going to be looking at this legislation with the idea of possibly attaching it to a larger bill. So that would be great because that was, it's, hmm? that's today and tomorrow, yes. Yeah. So that would kind of fast track the, um, this bill if it got attached to something bigger. So that, that's great news. Um, the, we also still have the uh, market pricing program uh, bill out there. It was originally H.R. 1717. Um, this was actually a bill to sort of really revamp the, um, whoa. Okay. Um, <laughs> 
Um, that's how I kind of feel sometimes with Medicare. Um, so this is actually to revamp the uh, Medicare uh, um, program to, to um, force CMS through legislation to revamp the program and to um, correct some of the, the real flaws in the program. And this was actually put together by auction experts. So these are people who um, know how these programs should run and, um, and are I, I think there was a letter. Do you know how many people were some? Oh, more. I think there was more than that. Like 200 and some. Um, this was back a couple of years ago. 200 and some experts in auctioning and f uh, economists and financial experts that signed on to a letter that went to CMS saying this program is ridiculous. It doesn't follow any of the au normal auction rules. This, this isn't that problem. I think there were five Nobel um, laureates on the, who were among the signi uh, signature, um, or the signus signers, what's the, signers. <laughs> um, so, 15, okay. So, um, NCMS ignored it, pretty much. So now we've taken the, um, led, uh, trying to take the legislative route. So you can see some of the things that this would do. It would um, require, again, a bid deposit. It would require binding bids. Um, the payment amount would be the clearing price bid. So right now it's the payment, single payment amount is an average of the highest and lowest bid um, among the, they take all the lowest, lowest bids and then they take the ones that the, the contractors that they're going to offer the contract to and then they average those. So 50% of the contract winners are actually getting less than what they bid right now. Um, instead of taking the, you know, that top bid from the, taking the top from the bottom if that makes sense. Um, it ensures transparency. One thing we have continued and continue to ask um, CMS for is, you know, tra transparency on how they came up with the bids, how they did the math, which I think is kind of fuzzy, but, um, and, uh, you know, how they chose the contract winners, et cetera, and it's not been forthcoming. Um, another big issue that we have is audits, and right now there is an enormous backlog of audits in the um, the level of um, uh, ALJ, um, which is the top level of the appeals process. Right now, there's, and this, this 900,000 um, claims that are awaiting ALJ review, does not, that's not just DME, that includes all um, claims, but um, they're getting, and they were, at the time this, this report came out, they were getting about 14,000 claims per week. So they calculated that if there were no additional appeals that came in, and they were doing 1,000 appeals per year, it would take 12.5 years to go through all the ones they currently have backlogged. Or they could do it in one year, but they'd need 828 ALJ teams. Um, and the problem for us is a lot of these claims that are having to go to this top level of appeal should never even get that far. A lot of them should be overturned at a much lower level. So some of that is happening now. But we've also got um, legislation, the Audit Improvement and Reform Act, or the AIR Act, which was introduced last year. Um, we're looking to introduce it this year, and I just got some other hot off the press intel that um, Representative Elmers is ready to drop the bill again for this year. And it looks like maybe Tammy Duck, Representative Duckworth, Tammy Duckworth, um, who is a consumer um, of DMA, she's a wheelchair user, that she may, um, be uh, the Democratic lead on this. So that's great news um, if we hear from that, and we're, we're hoping to hear that very shortly. Um, so basically, again, it's designed to increase the transparency and education and outreach um, of the appeals, um, and it will, would, as you know, there's a number of auditors out there doing audits, there's a number of contractors out there doing audits, so it would apply to all of them and very DME focused. So um, I've got a, a link there if you want more information on that. Um, copy of the legislation, there's um, a brief if you don't want to read through the whole legislation, and then, you know, how you can support it. Again, this is one of those, um, right now we need all of you calling your Congress people, visiting your Congress, uh, people in Congress, and getting them to sign on for the, to this once we have the new bill number. Um, and again, this is just some of the um, things I talked about. Um, one of the things, too, it would really help to protect if, if they do a number of audits on a supplier and the, the claims are clean, then they'd kind of leave you alone for a while. So basically it would be um, uh, sort of uh, rewarding good behavior, so to speak. 
um, limit the back uh, time back period to three years. Um, oh, another huge thing, the first one right there, is right now the reviewers, as you know, or hopefully know, um, the medical reviewers for these contractors are not allowed to use cl clinical inference. So if they, even if they think, you know, they have a lot of them are nurses or have, you know, clinical backgrounds, and even if they read the medical documentation and, and say, yeah, I, this person really does, I can tell this person really needs this equipment, they are not allowed to make that professional, professional leap. They have to just go by the, you know, what's written on the paper. So this would restore that clinical inference. Um, I'm going to make a plug here also for People for Quality Care. Um, this is an organization that is um, an advocacy, advocacy um, organization for the consumer to try to really get the consumer involved in some of these issues, in particular with competitive bidding. Um, and we have uh, several links there that you can go to to um, find out more information and also to send your consumers to. Um, but in particular, they have a hotline if there are, hmm? oh, sorry. Um, these links are worth going to. They are pre-made postcards that you can print up and put in your lobby, put in your referral center's lobbies that say, you know, are you having trouble getting equipment? Call this number so that they can start logging people who are having access issues. So when Congress says, where are all the people? They're at home because they don't have equipment. <laughs> and this is how they can um, get this. So our job is to go to this website, print that, and then start teaching people how to use it. Um, if they call the hotline, uh, they will, first of all, they will um, be directed on how to call the Medicare hotline, but also they, the uh, people for quality care will patch, help that person patch into uh, the um, office of their folks in Congress so that the consumers can talk directly to their legislators and, and voice a complaint. And one of the big issues, uh, you know, Cong uh, CMS has been touting since competitive bidding started that there's no access issues. And they're saying, we're not receiving, we don't have, uh, you know, registered complaints. And you can see on here, uh, they, at this point when this was compiled, they had a log of 120 total complaints. That's on the, the, uh, the right-hand side here. Whereas People for Quality Care, we have logged 2,700. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a lot more. Now there's a lot more than that um, since this time. One of the issues is that when somebody calls and complains, like say, let's say an end user calls and they say, I can't find a supplier to, um, where I can get a walker, you know, they're in a competitive bid area and they can't use their, the, you know, supplier that they've been using for ever and ever and they're told to go to a contract winner and they can't, and they call some of those contract winners and, you know, they say we don't provide them or we don't, you know, we don't carry that one or whatever. So they call the Medicare hotline. Medicare will give them a list of all the contract winners in that competitive bid program. Um, say, thank you very much, Mrs. Smith. Hang up. And to them, that's, that, that issue has been taken care of, and it's not logged as a complaint. So there's a lot of complaints that they take care of um, by giving phone numbers or whatever. And yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, maybe we just wear them out, right? Um, so with people for quality care, they're they're getting a lot of these, um, tracking a lot of the true complaints and um, and uh, you know submitting these. These go uh, to um, in reports to Congress. So um, it, this is just a kind of a list of. If you go on on the website, you'll see some of this information. But a list of what those complaints were, how many were um, that they weren't happy with the new provider. It was difficult to get supplies. There was no provider available for repairs, so there's, they're even tracking, um, people for quality care is tracking what kind of complaints there were as well, what, the, what they were. Um, and this is again, 30% 30, 30 um, of the people called in contacted Medicare, 68% uh, agreed to be, um, uh, to call into their Congress, um, and 100%, they always, we always recommend that they call Medicare as well. 
Okay, um, we have are, are available for questions. We have a microphone here. So does anyone have a question for either Laura or myself? Uh, regarding repairs, it's there, a medical necessity still has to be current in the physician or some other clinician's medical record. Uh, is Medicare changed the nature of medical necessity and how we establish it? So what they're saying is um, for people who have patient-owned equipment, the, the medical necessity for qualifying for that equipment in the first place, yes. they no longer have that burden. But the burden that they still have continued need for the equipment yes. and that the equipment needs to be repaired must be in the medical record. Right. And how is that met? With, Through the obje with objective measurements of, of any statement that the doctor makes. If or the supplier documentation. How you mean this, we can document, you can document medical necessity? Not medical necessity, but what, what needs to be done to the chair. I, I, no, I'm concerned about continued medical necessity. That has to be from the doctor or the therapist. And what would continued medical necessity constitute? It would be the same as if the person was being established. The can you hold it closer so people can place. hear you? It would, it would seem to be the same as if the person was being qualified for the product in the first place. It's got to be in the medical record, medical necessity. Now, if you can show me something in writing from CMS that says that we do not have to have medical necessity in the medical record within the last 12 months, I'm, I'm happy to do these repairs. They have, I'll show you the references. Where it says we don't have to have... You, have to, you don't have to show medical... The, me the, the medical necessity has been established for the base equipment. Medical necessity is necessary. Correct. Only if it only. Yeah. Basically, the medic, what has to happen is the physician needs to be able to document that there's still ongoing need for the equipment. So I'm going to cl clarify something a little more specific. I've had an issue, I'm a therapist, and I've had issues getting repairs done to chairs where the place that the, the provider is no longer in business and the people that I'm contacting to repair say, I need proof that the patient owns it, like the scooter store, and they never got that they owned it, or I need a you know, copy of the original prescription. Is that still needed then? No, that's okay. what's good. That initially burden's been removed. It was, initially it was. Initially they said that the, the um, supposedly, particularly with the scooter store, the um, scooter store was supposed to send out letters to all the beneficiaries saying that they, you know, owned the equipment or whatever. Um, and Medicare was requiring that letter, they no longer require that. In the back. Yeah. Can you repeat the, have them repeat the question? Can you bring it back? denials and still be in business or do they go ahead and get secure new business that they can get paid for that's your biggest problem that's going on right now yeah we're aware of the that issue but I think that what we do need um, and I actually was at a meeting at CMS is, is Rita Stanley or Don Clay back in the room 
My phone of friends didn't come. <laughs> How disappointing. All right, so I went to a meeting with them to CMS, and um, they're, they're working on a process where you'll be able to submit claims that were, den see me afterwards. <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna get you the right answer. Sorry, I don't no. know No, any other questions? <laughs> Yes. Yes. Uh, we do not know. Um, that, yeah, I mean, <laughs> supposedly the demo project is supposed to end at that point, but you know, it could be that prior to that, they may say that we're going to continue it, or um, you know, the initial thing was this is a demo project, so we're going to look at it over these two or three years. Uh, if they, if at that point they decide that it's been very successful, they could expand it across the country. They could just add more states. So I don't, we don't know. Any other questions? Yes. On the bundled? Bundle items. Will we ever be able to replace them, or do we not know yet? Well, you'll be responsible for... No. Oh, we, okay, we get to keep them going forever. It's for the lifetime of the... About of, 60 yes. years? Of, of the, the equipment. What's the lifetime of the equipment? Five years. Five years. And then we have to document 60% need of, uh, or a replacement of uh, repair costs exceeding 60% of the cost of the item? You, under bundling, you have to, oh, for whether it needs replace. replacement or not? Yes, yes. Yeah, right. we don't know. There are many, many unanswered questions okay. under okay. the, you know, bundled yeah. payment proposal. Or it's not even a proposal anymore. Okay, thank you very much, you guys. If you have questions, um, we're available.